I'm very honored to introduce our first chat speaker this quarter, um, Barry Mazur from Harvard. And so I guess Barry is again a mathematician. We don't really need to recall how great he is. So he started his math career in topology, where he proved um, Schoenfly's conjecture in his thesis. Then he developed interests in number theory and then proved the famous theorem classifying torsion of elliptic curves over Q. And from this, we already see that Barry has a very broad interest from topology to number theory. And in fact, his interests extend outside of mathematics to like literature and history. And as a student of Barry, I also see how he views things in a very unique and hybrid perspective. Um, when I'm stuck on working out details, this might not be very helpful, but this hybrid way of thinking is definitely um, what characterizes a great mathematician. So we are very happy to have Barry here today to tell us about um, his thoughts on primes and knots connecting um, number theory and topology. Please. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you Chi Yun for that amazing introduction. I hope I can um, uh, live up to it in this uh, very informal chat. I mean, take the word chat seriously here, even though I know it's an acronym for career history and thoughts. Um, what I would like to do, oops, uh oh, ah, no, I see it. <laughs> I, th I sort of see it. Um, Suppose I go like that. Ah, yeah, okay. I figured out how to run my computer here. So I wanna thank both Shekhar and Chiyun for um, asking me to take part in this experiment. They called it an experimental series of talks. And uh, Shekhar, when he um, invited me to do it, asked me to take a step back, talk about uh, larger visions that were then incarnated in specific results, specific influences. And I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, it um, uh, has given me the excuse to think about that, uh, the various evolutions of interest and focus that I, but not only I, but uh, I and other mathematicians have had. Um, and it may be, uh, uh, interesting to other people just to consider arcs of interest that connect different fields, different projects, evolutions. And some of them are especially interesting in the sense that they're more personal than formal. So the analogy I'm going to um, make has a formal aspect, but um, for me, it, it it's helped me enormously, but also it's not a clean analogy. So it constantly raises questions uh, about uh, the ragged aspects of it. So those questions I think I want to um, frame in terms of the uh, Q&A that uh, will happen afterwards. Okay, so I'm talking about uh, evolution. For example, evolution of various subjects. You can think of algebraic geometry uh, it had its center of gravity um, uh, up to um, up to I would say the end of the Second World War in the Italian school led by Severi, and the temper of that school was non-rigor. They were very very focused on the geometry of algebraic geometry, and that was their primary source of intuition. And one of the freedoms they took for themselves was to um, assume that the objects that they, they were dealing with could be uh, put in general position. And that was simply a, a given. You can do it. You have two, two uh, uh, varieties in, a, in an ambient space. You just take their intersection. You expect it to be uh, um, uh, somehow juggled to be in general position, and they would often give no formal justification for this. One of the famous uh, examples, I wonder whether there anybody in this, um, uh, uh, in this seminar is um, old enough to remember this. Uh, there was uh, 
Severi's uh, book on algebraic geometry had a number of appendices. And the specific one is I'm thinking of that everyone uh, at a certain moment was uh, uh, thinking of was um, uh, called Anhang F, which is Appendix F, where they he proved the um, irreducibility of a certain moduli space, but uh, the proof was just not correct, and uh, it took a while before people could uh, finally um, come to some understanding of uh, how to deal with it. And the person specifically, well, there are a, 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 a number of people, but uh, specifically Oscar Zariski, who um, uh, dealt seriously with Anhang F. Um, and in the course of that, or perhaps uh, um, uh, even because of that, uh, made use of powerful commutative algebraic uh, um, uh, tools, the algebra of uh, Krull and Nurta. And he added this to the in intuitions of the Italians. And by the way, the same time, uh, uh, algebraic approaches were uh, cropping up everywhere and there's a kind of ultra algebraic approach to it. Uh, and the algebraic geometry of curves, I wonder whether people have ever um, read uh, Chevalet's introduction to the theory of algebraic functions of one variable. And um, if you did, you'd be uh, struck by the fact that there wasn't a single diagram, <laughs> not a single geometric picture not even the, I don't think the word geometry, I think it's all about fields. Uh, and it reminded me of uh, not quite the same time, maybe a, um, a small generation before this Ulipo uh, novel um, uh, by um, the novelist Georges Perec, who um, uh, decided to write a novel in French without the letter E called La Disparition. So here is um, uh, ultra algebra, no um, um, <clears throat> geometry uh, to speak of. And um, his seminar was, was fantastic though. I, uh, I, was at, I, I attended it, it was in 57 or 58 in Paris. And he was already developing things that you might uh, imagine to be the uh, early, early, early hints of uh, um, elements um, in uh, Grotendi's uh, language of schemes. Now, I am a, this is the late 50s of the past century. I was a graduate student working in topology. At that time, I would call that pure topology, which uh, meant that I felt its true mission was to understand topological truths unencumbered by the crutches of smoothness hypotheses or uh, algebraic structure. And as um, uh, Chiyun said, I uh, proved the Schoenfli's conjecture, which says that some reason that any reasonably colored um, n minus one dimensional sphere in n space is topologically the standard n minus one dimensional sphere is topologically unknotted. And uh, this was um, following of uh, my uh, uh, incredible uh, amazement with the um, great uh, topological constructions of R.H. Bing. He, uh, the, most amazing one is he showed that the double closure of the bad component of the complement of the Alexander Horan sphere in the three dimensional sphere is just um, the three dimensional sphere again. And so, what you get uh, from this construction is um, thoroughly wild and, as I wrote here, untamable involution of the three sphere. So anyway, I was fascinated by knots and uh, their real idiosyncratic properties, especially. And uh, I was uh, 
very aware that they are sort of absolutely vital to for the understanding of three-dimensional topology in any depth that um, uh, uh, and that the these knots really govern the um, the great advances and evolution of at least three-dimensional topology that field but they form a link to many other seemingly far-flung aspects of mathematics. Uh, anyway, in time, I found myself uh, drawn towards algebraic geometry um, through real algebraic geometry. We applied Nash theory to studying periodic points of diffeomorphisms, so Michael, uh, Michael Arton and I. And then I got interested in Grotendieck and um, especially how it uh, launched this uh, fusion of uh, arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. This arithmetic, algebraic, geometry is a phrase that you hear very often now, but I mean, it was certainly a new thing, a very new thing uh, uh, given Grotendieck. And uh, I was trying to get a feel for number theory. And the way, one way to, I felt one could do this was um, depending on the, uh, as I put it here in this slide, the striking and helpful analogy between knots and primes. So um, when um, uh, Chiun and Shekhar have asked me to talk about chat, about uh, some influences and um, uh, sort of arcs of the of uh, of interests uh, from knots to primes is certainly an arc that I felt. Hey, why don't I talk about it a little bit? Um, a lot of you may know much of what I'm going to say, which is fine, but there'll be, I hope there'll be a Q&A. In fact, I, what I should be doing is uh, uh, timing it so as to leave a lot of time for Q&A. Um, but uh, that's, this is what I want to chat about. So, so I have this basic analogy between knots and primes, and that brings topological structures and somehow, but basic topological structures in connection with arithmetic structures. And if you want to uh, see what that analogy asks you to consider, here's a, I, what I would call a kind of a preliminary list of analogies that you might uh, uh, be looking for, uh, for example, quadratic reciprocity, as I think I'll try to um, uh, hint at or talk about, about a little later in this uh, talk, is absolutely um, uh, the analogy uh, to the skew symmetry of winding numbers of, of knots. And the Ewasel polynomial, the analogy of the Alexander polynomial, in which case you'd say, well, hey, if the USL, if you claim the Ewasel polynomial is analogous to the Alexander polynomial, what is the piatic L function analogous to? And I'm not quite sure. And similarly, if you claim the Alexander polynomial is uh, analogous to the Iwasawa polynomial, you might ask. Uh, there's the two variable, absolutely marvelous uh, polynomial, which is an extension of the Alexander polynomial. What does that uh, correspond to? And I'm also not quite sure. Um, in any case, it, prime numbers and knots is what uh, I want to focus on. And if you want to be even more precise, I would like uh, to think of prime numbers as sort of uh, more, even more analogous to what one would call hyperbolic knots, that is say knots where the complement of uh, the knot in the three and the three sphere is a, a, a given a hyperbolic structure, in which case you can talk about volume and the volume would correspond to log P. So you might ask, uh, are there statistical, are there ways of bringing uh, aspects of analytic number theory 
to some kind of statistical understanding of hyperbolic stuff. Um, uh, I say you can ask. I don't know the answer at all to this, but uh, you can ask. In any case, to make sense of this as, a, um, as an analogy, I start with spec Z and spec Z as the three-dimensional sphere. Well, to get started, we know that any finite um, flat uh, extension of the ring of integers um, uh, is ramified. So um, uh, we can think of S, if we want to think of S as uh, in really uh, geometric terms, we'd say S is simply connected. And as for the cohomology, uh, as I think um, most people in the seminar knows um, uh, the class field theory is going to give us a, sort of a real bead on the cohomology of uh, spec Z. Um, but um, uh, to make it more geometric, we want to formulate it in the vocabulary of uh, et al or uh, other cohomology theories. So the cohomology with coefficients in the, in the multiplicative group, GM, is well known and uh, 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 it's striking when, uh, of course, I is zero, no problem. It's just uh, the units in Z. The thing about, about I is one and two is that uh, it's, it vanishes as it does when I is greater than three. And when I is three, the three-dimensional cohomology sits there as a receptacle, if you want, of a duality, a kind of Poincaré duality. We should say that the GM, of course, is not um, is not trivial. So it's a it's a Poincaré duality where the if if we think of uh, spec Z as like the three sphere, it's uh, only oriented by GM. It's uh, not um, elementarily oriented, if you wish. And the natural um, <clears throat> uh, easiest statement of uh, a duality theorem that is analogous to Poincaré duality is a uh, finite flat duality. That is say, if you have a finite flat group scheme, over spec Z, and you take F star to be its Cartier dual, which is also, again, a finite flat group seam of the same order, then uh, <clears throat> it has a, a three-dimensional duality, cohomology with coefficients uh, uh, in F. Uh, the ith cohomology is uh, dual to the um, uh, three minus ith cohomology with coefficients in the Cartier dual. And, this is a perfect pairing, and the perfect pairing is given by cup product. So, uh, so I'm thinking of S as morally two connected, and it has a three-dimensional Poincaré duality. Um, and now let's consider knots in it. So let's let P be a prime. We'll consider reduction mod P and let Kp, Kp, K is uh, to remind you that it, I'm thinking of it as a knot, and P is to remind you that it's associated to P, and it um, the natural reduction and this is an injection of uh, the scheme spec Fp and spec Z, and this is what's analogous to uh, uh, the uh, knot in three. <laughs> Three space. The fundamental group of Kp, as uh, I think everyone in this seminar knows, um, alias uh, the Galba group of Fp bar of Fp is canonically isomorphic to z hat, the profinite completion of z. So um, if we're thinking of it uh, um, geometrically, we'll, after all, uh, spec. Uh, Fp bar is contractible, so Kp is a, it's homotopically a Kz hat one space. It's a, it's a, it's like a, a one sphere curve. Now the complement 
uh, comes from adjoining, adjoining the inverse of P. And so here we have XP, the complement of uh, the knot in the three sphere. Um, and there it is in terms of uh, its rings. And so um, uh, we can compare that with the topologist knot complement, which is the same thing. And in, the, in topology, we have Alexander duality. It establishes a Z duality between the cohomology, between one dimensional cohomology and uh, um, two dimensional relative cohomology. Uh, and so therefore, um, uh, we have a canonical isomorphism of um, uh, H1 of X Z with Z. And that tells us that if we have the complement of a knot, uh, there, the maximal abelian extension of that complement that's uh, a covering space of S3 minus K that's unramified K, that's unramified outside K, I should say, is, um, um, uh, has a deck covering group Z. And um, I can think of that group of deck transformations. Oh, oops, what did I just do? Um, and I could think of that group of uh, deck transformations uh, um, of uh, the maximal being covering space of X as um, uh, having um, uh, an action of this group of deck transformation, let us say an action of Z. And so we can set uh, pi K to be the fundamental group of the knot, pi one of the complement. And we could take the abelianization and the abelianization is Z. Now up to isotopy, the knot complements is, uh, uh, can be thought of as a compact manifold with torus boundary. And within that torus, we have loops, the meridial loop and the radial loop. Um, and I'm assuming my knot is oriented, by the way. Uh, we have the meridial loop defined up to homotopy. Uh, is uniquely defined up to homotopy, and uh, we have a uh, the radial loop, which is sort of the shadow of the knot, which is not quite defined up to homotopy, but uh, uh, pretty much defined anyway. And so we have the standard um, the standard uh, uh, collection of. Um, uh, uh, fundamental groups. This is the fundamental group of the knot. This is its uh, um, uh, uh, the, here's its uh, abelianization. There's the commutator subgroup. Oh, sorry. <laughs> here's its abelianization, uh, and here's the commutator subgroup, and here's the abelianization of the commutator subgroup, and that maps in a. a natural way, essentially by tensoring with Q, uh, to uh, a finite dimensional vector space that depends upon K. And the group of deck transformations, the Z, acts on that finite dimensional vector space. And what you get is uh, uh, the natural action of that canonical generator gives you the Alexander polynomial of the knot. Now, there are other, many other uh, combinatorial ways of defining the Alexander polynomial, but I prefer to define it this way because I'm uh, pushing the analogy. And um, I should say that one of the most interesting ways for me is uh, through the combinatorial braid group because there might very well be a, a, a number theoretic analogy. Um, and the Hofley's uh, polynomial, which is a polynomial of two variables, that's a refinement of the Alexander polynomial. So here's a possible way of viewing the zeros of the Alexander polynomial that's uh, sort of natural enough. 
uh, you uh, for every, you 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 take the the canonical generator of uh, pi ab and you send it to a complex number, and so with that you get um, uh, complex valued uh, linear systems in X that are parameterized by uh, complex numbers. And then you take the one dimensional cohomology with that um, twisted group of coefficients. And um, you have that uh, the uh, dimension of that cohomology group as a function of Z is uh, a very interesting function of z and it vanishes um, um, uh, and it's equal to the order at each for each z of the uh, order of vanishing of um, the order of vanishing of the alexander polynomial at z okay um now, I, one, one thing that occurred to me while I was working, while I was brooding about this uh, analogy is since the analog uh, is um, uh, the etal fundamental group, the analog and number theory, uh, the etal fundamental group is not the fundamental group of the knot, the fundamental group of the knot is a sort of is an honest group, so to speak, and the the etal fundamental group of um, uh, uh, in um, uh, in in algebraic geometry is of course a profinite group. So we could go back and consider uh, define two knots to be profinitely equivalent. <laughs> if there's an isomorphism between the profinite completions of their group? That's an interesting question. Anyway, I asked, uh, uh, now uh, I should, I, I, I have here uh, in the slide, this uh, uh, something to remind me to mention the gordon lewick theorem, which in um, knot theory simply says, if you know that knot group, you know the knot up to equivalence, but I've never seen um, whether if you know the knot group, the profinite completion of the knot group, you know the knot. And so you could um, um, ask that question. And we'll, I asked, uh, I did ask, and uh, if you look at the footnote here, apparently um, there's going to be some, uh, some, uh, uh, results about this and uh if i if i learn them and if they you know if they get written up and published uh, in a later draft of these notes i'll include some discussion of that and also we can go further and say that a non invariant has a profinite definition if it can be computed directly from the profinite completions <clears throat> of the knot groups rather than from the knot groups, it's, from the knot group itself. And then you might ask which of the knot invariants have profinite definitions and, and therefore when I say carry over, I mean the an analogy is very, very close to uh, what uh, corresponds to them in the context of prime numbers and which do not. So the Alexander polynomial does have a profinite definition, but uh, uh, it's not obvious that the Holmfleet's does. Anyway, another question. The questions uh, actually are moving in the not theoretic direction. One should have questions moving in the number theoretic direction as well. But uh, uh, in any case, I want to go back to number theory and I want to take a look at the time. Okay. Um, so consider our prime, uh, but no, now our prime, we're viewing it as a knot, that knot KP embedded in the, our, so to speak, three sphere, that is say spec Z. And then we have our knot complement that we've discussed before. Um, now, uh, an argument absolutely uh, analogous to uh, Alexander duality uh if you want there are other arguments as well as 
I'm sure people in the seminar know, uh, establishes a canonical isomorphism between um, uh, H1 of this XP, the, the analogy of the complement of the knot with uh, ZP star. And ZP star is, uh, after all, a, a cyclic profinite group, um, ZP star being the group of units in the ring ZP. Uh, and of course, uh, another way of saying this is what is much more familiar to everyone here, I think, is that uh, the maximal Lebesgue extension of Q unramified outside the prime um, P uh, and infinity, I should say, consists of the field generated over Q by the union of all P power roots of unity. And the Galois group is ZP star. Again, uh, this is a uh, standard in um, ZP star, we can write as FP star cross uh, an actual infinite cyclic uh, pro P group that's isomorphic to ZP as a pro P group, namely uh, the, um, uh, the pro P group generated by uh, one units in ZP uh, cross FP star, which is cyclic of order P minus one. And so um, we have uh, that uh, all finite abelian coverings of our, so to speak, three sphere spec Z branched at our, so to speak, not KP have Galois groups that are cyclic and canonically isomorphic to finite quotients of, of Z, Z mod P to the MZ star. And um, we can, of course, set lambda as usual to be the completed ZP integral group ring of ZP star. And as a standard, uh, this ring is isomorphic product of um, P, P minus one copies of the power series ring and one variable. And um, um, so uh, for every I, <clears throat> Uh, uh, well, for, um, for, for every I mod P minus one, let me put it that way. We have our un standard unique, um, um, uh, way of expressing, uh, ZP star as a product of, uh, P minus one copies of, uh, the power series ring in T with coefficient ZP. Um, and um, we're, we're in standard Iwasawa theoretic, uh, um, uh, on, let me say, the standard Iwasawa theoretic grounds here. And uh, where am I here? Okay, and so what do I want to do? I want to um, um, I want to uh, define part of the etal fundamental group of the complement of the knot, which I'll call pi kp, uh, which I can also call an unusual uh, Galois language uh, G, Q, P infinity. That is to say the Galois group uh, maximal, uh, uh, the Galois group of the maximal extension of Q that's unramified except at P and infinity. And then uh, as in the topological knot game, we have uh, inertia and decomposition groups um, that correspond to our knots, and uh, um, as uh, uh, as in the knot game, we also have the Galois group of the maximal Abelian extension of the complement of that knot is uh, uh, infinite cyclic at ZP star, 
and we get um, uh, again an action of um, our group lambda on the cohomology of um, uh, of uh, that um, uh, complement of the knot, and in the end we get a um, lambda tensor QP module VK, which is a uh, which is gotten by um, um, uh, by the diagrams I gave before, and the, this is standard Iwasawa theory. So in the end, we get um, a finite dimensional QP vector space um, uh, corresponding to um, I, I equals an uh, integer mod p minus one that um, with a an action of um, um, an action operating on that vector space uh, to get our Iwasawa polynomial. Okay, and the Iwasawa polynomial is by um, uh, the main conjecture uh, directly connected to the zeros of the Leopold Kubota L function. These are standard things that I think this uh, seminar knows. Um, um, sorry for having to go through it very fast, but um, but I want to make some comments on the comparison and differences. That is, say, if by unknotted you mean that the fundamental group of knot is a B, and every prime is knotted. And there is no real equivalent to wild inertia. And um, there, there is no clear duality. The Alexander polynomial uh, has a duality on the inversion T goes to T inverse. But that's because its um, coefficient ring, which is Z or Q, is uh, self-dual, but GM is not self-dual, and so therefore you wouldn't expect the Iwasawa polynomial to satisfy any uh, elementary duality of the sort that we have with the Alexander polynomial. And in any way, um, we can uh, go on to look at, um, now I wonder, Maybe I'll, I'll do this. We can go on to look at um, uh, links. So you can consider embedding of two knots. And when you consider the embedding of two knots in analogy uh, to uh, number theory, we can take the image of the generator of uh, pi one of each of the knots. I'll call them frob K and frob L and they map into the, um, uh, complement, but uh, frob k maps into the complement of uh, the knot L, and frob L maps into the complement of the knot k if the L and k are um, uh, disjoint knots, there they form links. So if you want to compare them, of course, you have to do something, and the way you compare them is you identify the abelianization of the complement of the knot K of the fundamental group of the, of the complement of the knot K with Z, you make the same identification of the fundamental group of the knot L with Z, and then you can try to make a comparison. And when you do make the comparison, um, uh, the um, uh, natural cup product of fundamental classes uh, tells you that you have a skew symmetry of linking number. If you try to do that in, uh, in um, number theory, you're in even worse shape because you can't make the comparison. Uh, even if you have two primes, you have one prime, you can think of it as um, uh, it's um, Frobenius uh, uh, giving us uh, a, uh, um, 
uh, an element in the fundamental group of the, of, uh, of, uh, the other prime and vice versa, but um, they're in entirely different groups, which I called pi L and pi K. And so in order to make any comparison, you have to do even um, more than just pass to their abelianizations. What you have to do is you uh, notice that their abelianizations, ZP star and ZQ star, have unique um, uh, quotient groups of order two. <laughs> And so uh, quotient group of order two, the two quotient group of order two can be uh, uh, therefore uh, canonically compared. And when you do that, of course, you get, um, um, you, you, you can define a linking number of P with Q, but it's an element in ZQ star. You can define a linking number of Q with P, but it's an element in ZP star. And there's no clear way to make any correspondence, but if you, um, uh, pass to their uh, quotient groups of order two, you can make the correspondence and of course you get quadratic reciprocity. Okay, so all this is a very fast, um, uh, probably um, even too detailed uh, discussion of um, uh, the things that are known in terms of uh, the connection between primes and knots, that is say quadratic reciprocity really is a, a nice uh, analogy to skew symmetry of winding numbers. Uh, the Iwasawa polynomial is a nice analogy to Alexander polynomial and the rest uh, um, is some, perhaps open for discussion. And uh, one other thing that one might discuss is uh, uh, Borromean rings, that would be a little too um, technical because it corresponds to massy triple products, which uh, not only makes sense uh, in, uh, in number theory, but have been um, uh, the subject of a certain amount of work by Morishita and others. And um, Analogous analogs of the Chebotarov uh, theorem for at least for hyperbolic knots. That is to say, um, one of the things I'm mu musing about is can you imagine um, a collection, a countable, nice collection of knots in the three sphere that? Um, um, they're hyperbolic and so therefore they actually have a volume and therefore you can talk about them as um, an infinite set of primes and with um, uh, uh, increasing um, norm, if you wish. The question is, uh, is there an analog of the Chebotarov theorem that we can talk about? Now I asked uh, people, in fact, I asked uh, uh, Kirk McMullen, he um, has come up with some some beautiful ideas, and um, but um, uh, this is an open subject. So uh, that's what I wanted to uh, chat about with you. I hope I didn't go too fast. I hope I didn't give too many or too few details. But uh, let me stop sharing, and we can talk. Let's thank Barry for his brilliant talk. And I guess you think you plan to have a Q&A session right now? How about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Any question for Barry? Perhaps you could say something about the massy products and uh, what you were, or do if you. Oh, sure. Okay. So um, the thing about um, massy triple products is um, whenever you have uh, a link made of, out of, say, three components, three knots, and it tends to work really well if uh, 
any two of those three are unlinked, mm -hmm. then uh, in contrast to the, um, um, to the winding number that you would have for two, two knots, you get a, an invariant, which uh, can be thought of as a number, which uh, tells you how, you know, how linked the three are, even though no two are linked. You, you see what I mean? Now that, uh, that comes from uh, um, three variable uh, cohomology operation that, um, uh, I mean, the natural thing would be you take those three things and you just take the cup product of all three of their fundamental cycles and you, but then you, that would give you nothing. <laughs> but what you get is a, sort of a secondary operation to the cup product of all three, which, you, which happens if uh, the cup product of any two is zero. And the secondary operation isn't in three-dimensional space, but it's in two-dimensional space, which is where you want it. That's called a messy, messy triple product. I mean, uh, um, I shouldn't say that's called a messy triple product. The messy triple product is a general cohomology operation of that uh, framework, but one applies it usually to knots to um, analyze when uh, three knots can't be disentangled, even though any two of those three can. And of course, uh, you might imagine there's a similar thing for a three primes, and there is, which is great. <laughs> but the Chebotarov, I, I think, is, is it could be interesting uh, in that um, there are ways of getting a countable number of knots sitting in the same three-dimensional sphere um, uh, having to do with um, um, I mean, they, 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 having to do with certain actions. And you have these countable knots. And so if you have, and they're disjoint, and if you take um, one of them and you try to map the others into the complement of that one, you get a, uh, um, and, you, and you think of each of those other knots as giving you a Frobenius element in, um, in uh, say, some finite Galois extension of the three sphere ramified at the initial knot, you might hope to uh, have such natural, na natural examples of such things where the Chebotarov theorem holds and I think this might uh, be pretty interesting from the vantage point of uh, hyperbolic manifolds. Anyway, um, people have begun to think about this, which I'm happy about. May I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Is there, <laughs> is there any uh, similar kind of analogy for uh, varieties over spec Z, like curves over spec Z? Well, you know, you would think so. Well, here's the here's the here's the thing. Um, I mean, the answer is you would think so, but just imagine uh, what happens in higher dimensional knot theory. Um, there's a there's a lot to go through to define. I mean, the Schoenfeld theorem is the is is a piece of higher dimensional knot theory, but it's, but that's, uh, once, once you begin to ask, oh, what can you say about, uh, what can you say about, um, say, a co-dimension two manifolds in an ambient um, sphere, so N minus, two manifolds in an n-sphere. Um, it's a rather complicated theory 
and it's a, a rather beautiful theory. I mean, the, the, one of the big issues is um, uh, uh, is this, uh, you have a kind of stability element that is say you can take the cone over this thing and you would still have a co-dimension two thing <laughs> in, uh, uh, in, in a sphere if the, um, uh, anyway, there's so many questions to ask already on a topological level. And of course you and I know <laughs> that what, you, what you're asking is uh, um, invariant questions about a co-dimension of two algebraic variety and another, there's something to be done, but uh, that's further on in, uh, in the lifespan of the subject, I think. Um, just a minute ago, you were talking about the analogy of massy triple products for, for primes. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little more about what the, uh, what the number theory side of the analogy is? There? It's almost identical, actually. I mean, the thing is, uh, you have uh, the if you think of the um, um, if you think of quadratic reciprocity as really coming from taking um, two fundamental classes within H1 and you're taking the cup product to an H2 and you, and you somehow organize it so that that H2 will uh, give you, a, you know, give you an element in a group of order two. <laughs> so you have, if you put it, uh, that way as, um, um, how to put it, uh, as the cohomological way of describing the uh, Legendre um, symbol. There's a similar thing. You could, you take three primes and each of these three primes, they, you have a spec, um, uh, FP, spec FQ, spec FL, <laughs> and um, they are mapping into the same, um, into the same spec, uh, spec Z. So you could take, um, uh, you, you're, you're, you're dealing with um, the, a cup product of three H1s, But you don't want the cup product. You want the um, the cohomology operation that brings you not into an H three, but brings you into an H two, provided any of the pair cup products are trivial. So if if I know that P is a square mod Q, Q is a square mod L, L is a square mod P, and I want another invariant that tells me something about the geometry that I would get by taking coverings of spec Z that are ramified at P, Q, and L. There is an invariant. <laughs> the invariant is a mod two invariant, I believe. And uh, it's, give, it's given by not taking the triple cup product of those H1s, but by taking the, the cohomology operation that you get when all of the mutual cup products, the pairwise cup products vanish. So I vaguely remember that either Minya or maybe even Romyar did something with the massive triple product in number theory. What, what do you know what they did? I, isn't Romyar here? Romyar here, <laughs> but <laughs> my memory is weak. So is that right, Romyar? Uh, yeah, I so did. Can you see what, what um, it is in terms of? Well, I didn't know. I didn't consider this this specific setting. I was I was studying Iwasawa theory of Coomer extensions of um, cyclotomic, um, you know, the cyclotomic ZP extension that Barry was talking about. So um, uh, I would be taking. I mean, I guess he's talking more about Frobenius elements here in, in Spexby. So I mean, it's a little different, but. 
uh, yeah, the analogy with, I mean, yeah. So, so did you have same, use of this same, analogy same or doing, it just came up in some calculation? Uh, it came up in trying to understand the deeper structure of these, these sort of um, uh, Iwasawa modules over Coomer extensions. Um, rather than sort of the, the, you have some graded piece which comes from the Galois group of the Coomer extension. You look at the augmentation filtration on this thing and the first graded piece kind of looks like the cyclotomic thing below. And, and then sort of when you go to the next graded piece, uh, you're looking at cup products and you go to the next one, you're looking at a C triplet products. So, yeah. But in that case, it was of uh, where um, two of the characters are the same, so. So that's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, I had a historical question, question for Barry. I mean, these, these analogies, did, did, did it motivate, did it uh, influence the way you thought about Iwasawa theory and oh, yeah. conjecture? And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought, hey, I'm home. <laughs> and yet I knew nothing about number three. Uh, right. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that was that's absolutely. Um, and, and it's basically um, uh, that I felt a friend of the whole Iwasawa theoretic framework. Um, not that I knew anything. I didn't know anything, but I mean, I felt it was friendly to me because of uh, the Alexander polynomial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had a related question then. I mean, so uh, yeah, because there is this sort of analogy, but it was a while after you got into number theory that you, you know, you proved the main conjecture. So how did you move from, I mean, into, it was just a gradual thing to move into number theory and well, or, I would well, well, I spent a, yeah. a number of years uh, doing algebraic geometry. Well, and, you know, um, I right. became right. interested, really interested in, um, uh, uh, well, cr what crystalline cohomology, Durham cohomology, cohomology of uh, varieties mod p, which is, and. Um, mm -hmm. But I know, but I always had this, uh, I always had the idea of, uh, you know, it's friendly territory that. <laughs> so I was just curious, uh, is it possible to speculate like what the number theoretic analog of the Homfley polynomial? Um, like, well, to say I'd, love if, I'd love it if you did, Tony. <laughs> I, I, I don't actually know what the Humphrey polynomial is. So I, I was wondering oh, okay. if you can say anything about like. Hey, let me define the Humphrey polynomial. Well, there are two ways of of talking about it. The the, the, the first thing is that you can think of it as you can think of the braid group as being behind the scenes here. So the question is: Is there anything like the braid group that's behind the scenes of the Galois group of Q? Well, I mean, there is a uh, Grotenik's uh, de saint -Denfant. I don't know. <laughs> now, by the way, that's all I've ever thought about this subject, exactly what I've said. That there's a braid group connection to home fleas, and uh, there is um, a Grotenik's de saint -Denfant, which has a kind of combinatorially uh, a manageable attempt to understand Galois groups. And that's it. I haven't thought a minute beyond that. But now let me get back to the Humphreys polynomial. The Humphreys polynomial, unfortunately, the way it's usually defined goes way beyond the, um, goes way beyond the, uh, the analogy because it's defined by a recursive procedure where you take a knot and you sort of uh, break it up in a various ways. So for example, um, for
for example, one way of defining the Alexander polynomial is as a certain number of axioms where if, if you have a knot that, um, if, if you have a knot that, if you have a presentation of a knot which has a cross here, yeah? Uh, well, you have that knot and then you have the knot where you move the cross the other, on the, uh, the other side of the page, so at the bottom of the page rather than the front, front of the page. And then you have a third knot where you break the cross and you may turn it into two, two knots. So you have a, a way of engineering um, uh, three knots out of one. <laughs> And the Alexander polynomial can be defined in terms of a recursive procedure having to do with, the, with those triple of knots where you simplify the knot by you know, crossing and, and separating. Um, and uh, the Humphreys polynomial is defined very similarly, but it has uh, two variables, a very elegant um, a definition, but the definition is definitely recursive in destroying the knot. Now we don't want to, want, want to destroy any of our, any of our primes. <laughs> so we don't know how to make a recursive definition of um, uh, you know, the Galois group uh, unramified outside of P and infinity that way. On the other hand, the, you know, the, the Anabelian setup might, might prove, provide something. Again, I remember a little vaguely, but isn't there a, a, some complication in the analogy with the order two elements coming up and that doesn't give the dimension exactly three and there is some extra stuff? Order two of what? Order two elements in the Galois group. I mean, but, maybe I'm saying wrong. Uh, well, um, well, of course, first, if the prime is two, we, that's not what you mean, I think, no? If the prime no. is two, we're in, we're in worse shape, but... Uh, I thought there was some, in the calculus, there will be some Z mod 2Z uh, thing coming up, which... Oh, which, I, I, see what, infinite you know, I see I understand what you mean, yeah. That in cohomology, sometimes, <clears throat> If you form a, if you formulate the cohomology in the wrong way, you sometimes have, uh, because of um, uh, you sometimes have zima twos going all the way up. That's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 No, you have to be you have to be careful about that. No, that's true. So what what does it mean? You have to be careful. You have to orient appropriately. Mm -hmm. Once it's oriented, it goes away. It's a, this is a, um, a real prime situation. Right. This analogy between log p, you in, this, in these analogies, you had an analogy between log p and the volume of the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how does, how does that kind of play out or... I... I don't know. I'm 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 hoping that one can make oh the analogy between log p and the volume. Yeah. Simply that's a number. <laughs> and that number, I mean, if you organize the primes appropriately, you can you can uh, uh, in some way order knots in terms of uh, of um, of volume. And um, uh, and it's rather natural to try to ask uh, statistical questions about hyperbolic um, uh, three manifolds in terms of uh, in terms of their volume. But does this suggest any other organization of primes other than the size or congruences that from these analogies, like not have a different complexity hierarchies here? Primes, do you see? different than size or uh, congruence kind of classification? Well, I'm still, hoping, I'm still hoping for a really beautiful uh, example in knot theory. And uh, 
people have, people have begun to to define them. Uh, that is, say, um, cannibal sequences of knots. They're all hyperbolic, and they grow in volume in a nice way. And uh, um, I'm 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 guessing that the answer is yes. After after a while, that there'll be some some theory. Okay, is that, I think. I have a last question. Um, the event, hi. Your, uh, your linking numbers reminded me of the uh, tame symbols on the calculation of K2 of Q. What's, uh, is there a natural analogous thing on the not side to algebraic K theory? Say it again. The is there a natural analog of algebraic K theory of Integers or rational numbers on the on the not side. Not side. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could I I, I can make it up. <laughs> For example, in Iwasawa theory, we get a little bit of K theory by going all the way up the Iwasawa tower and then twisting a bit and then coming down, and you get something similar to K theory. I could one could manufacture certain numbers. Now the question is, what do they really mean? It's a good question, I don't know. But you, you know, I mean, you can, you can uh, uh, understand the K theory by um, passing to the, um, uh, you know, going all the way up the Uwasawa, the, the uh, Circle Atomic Tower and then, um, doing the right twist and coming down again and you get some some aspect of k theory i oh I, yeah you know you could do that you could do you could simply do that formally but formally would not be fun your question is really is there a a, a real substantial reason to do that in the not theoretic case and i don't know the answer good, uh, good. i don't know i mean i just figured K theory, so to speak, comes from topology. So maybe there would be something in the not theory realm. But I don't know. Mm -hmm.